Welcome everyone to Yahoo Finance Uncut. And I have today Katie Stockton, founder and managing partner of Fairly's Strategies, also a portfolio manager of the TAC ETF. I am Jared Blickery, your host, by the way. And let's get down to business and have Katie join us here. Katie, it's been uh, a while since you and I talked, uh, but I'll tell you what, you have been bearish over the last few months. I've quoted some of your work in my articles when it, th when it seemed like things were turning up. Just want to remind people we are in a bear market. Uh, we, are, we have come off of the lows very strongly over the last two days. Quick word to our audience, this is a tape program, so we're talking about price action around early October here, uh, but we're going to keep this conversation generalized and very much market-oriented, but bigger picture, so everybody can take something away from this. So Katie, please let me know your thoughts on where we are uh, with this incredible two-day surge in the midst of this big bear market that's confounding a lot of people. Of course, Jared, and, and good to see you. I, I think this bear market has uh, really sort of manifested itself across all risk assets. And that's been problematic because it's almost impossible for us as technical analysts to find stocks or other securities in long term uptrends where the probabilities are just better in terms of investing for the long term. So it puts us in a position where we really are forced to navigate the short term volatility, the short term swings in both directions. It's uh, you're right to have said that I've been bearish for a few months, really since late last year, uh, 2021. In October, we moved to a neutral long term stance and we moved to a bearish long term stance in January. And we did that primarily because our longer term indicators trend fall engages, if you will, things that are typically based off of moving averages of price, but all price based did start to show signs of exhaustion late last year. And unfortunately, they're not yet showing signs of downside exhaustion that are really high conviction at this time. So we're assuming that this bear market cycle or downtrend that's been in place here to date will keep its hold at least until we get some kind of basing phase. The reason we think that the the bear market cycle needs to end with a base as opposed to in sort of a, a very quick V bottom fashion is because if you just reference past bear market cycles, I mean, that that's how it tends to happen. It takes months at times, even more than a year, if you go back to uh, the 2000 bear market, to finally find a footing for the major indices. So I think it's going to be a drawn out process with the emphasis on that word process. Yes, uh, topping is a process, bottoming is a process, emphasizing process, can't emphasize that enough because patience uh, is required here. Bear markets tend to uh, last a lot longer than people are prepared for. And that's, I think, contrary to recent history where we just saw the, the fastest bear market in history over the pandemic, uh, followed by, I think, the fastest bull market recovery, just kind of a flash in the pan there uh, for newer investors who are looking at this market here. They may not be, uh, they might not have the market uh, memory that uh, that other people do going back to 2008, 2000 uh, to 2002. And just by way, I, I began this discussion with uh, the example of the last two days, uh, this incredible surge that we had here. Um, I hadn't seen anything like that in a while. So I crunched the numbers real quickly. And we saw that in Q4 in 2008, but we didn't see the low until several months, la months later in March of 2009. Very similar story for the uh, crash of the, of the uh, tech bubble in 2000. We saw that bear market take two years to play out, got a number of signals in between there. Uh, but just what are you looking at? If you're not looking for that V bottom, you want to look for the base. Uh, S&P 500, you were noting, I believe, 3,200. Is it possible? Uh, very bearish downside target here, 38.15. We, we left that last week. So where are you seeing this play out now? Yeah, and I mean, it's more than just about the levels, right? We really need to adhere to the indicators first and foremost and wait for them to signal some kind of entry. And, and we do rely on them for that. So we, the S&P 500 has some support on 3,500. It's apparent that the summertime lows are really not a strong support level, even though we're getting a bit of a bounce here in early October. Uh, we've seen so many stocks from a bottom-up perspective break that equivalent support at the summertime lows that we're trusting that the major indices will do the same. And for the S&P 500, the next support level is around 3,500. It's not a major level. It's sort of an interim level in our work with 
hit the next major level around 3200 as you reference and that's based on a long term Fibonacci retracement level. It's pretty widely followed as a support level for various reasons, uh, but importantly, if, if and when we test that level or even before then, we're really going to adhere to the indicators to flash some kind of buy signal. And that's the beauty of technical indicators is that they do take out some of the gray area of the markets and they will actually show crossovers or have interruptions in their down moves that would suggest that the market is getting into sort of a bottoming process or at a certain point is ready to advance from that basing phase. And, and we have ways to try to measure that. Things like the stochastic oscillator, things like the MACD indicator for all the technicians out there. Those are a big part of our process. You mentioned stochastic, MACD. I know you're, you also mentioned Fibonacci. I know you're a, far, a fan of DeMarc. And uh, but Yahoo Finance, by the way, has a lot of these indicators for free on our website. I encourage everybody to test them out. but. I, I like to keep these market conversations somewhat broad and get into the theory behind everything. And you are a CMT, which is Chartered Market Technician, as you have been for a while now. And can you just talk broadly about, or specifically about some of the indicators you like and why? And I just want to get into the conversation with hundreds and hundreds of indicators. There are some that are very widely known, some that are less well known, but it's up to the individual to find what works for them. And I'm wondering what works for you and how you're seeing things. Yeah, I think there's a, a couple of key points that I would make about our methodology or the way that we approach the markets. And first is that we approach the markets, at least the equity market, from a top-down perspective, meaning that we start with the be big benchmarks, right? The S&P 500 is our, our best example of that. And then we'd sort of drill into the sector relative strength, what sectors are outperforming, what momentum is, is looking like on the sector front. And then we take that and we drill into the individual stocks that comprise the major indices. And that gives us that kind of holistic view of top down and bottom up. We want to make sure the bottom up work is essentially supporting what we're seeing top down. We believe that the top down influence of the market is very strong for most individual stocks. So to have that understanding of the directional bias of the S&P 500, just puts you in a better place to, to succeed in your trading or investing. And I would say that maybe 70% of the move in any given stock is driven by the broader market and its sector. That's something that Tom Dorsey taught me a long time ago. And uh, that's really important to note. It just means that fundamental analysis is going to be very important, especially in bull market cycles. But there are times at which, especially during a bear market cycle, that the broader market is just going to drive that stock against your, your um, sort of fundamental biases, and you have to respect that price action. And we're talking about the general market here, S&P 500, the benchmark, Lots of other markets to consider, though, especially lately, we've seen the U.S. dollar strengthen considerably, although it's backed off of those highs. And I think that's been um, at least a, a big part of the risk on story that we've seen over the last few days. But more broadly, incredible tightening of financial conditions, as they call it, stronger U.S. dollar, higher interest rates. Uh, everybody finally kind of buying what Chair Powell has been saying is that they're, they're going to raise rates until something breaks. Um, how are you viewing some of these other markets right now, specifically currencies and bonds? Yeah, and I guess that's really part of our top-down process, too, to your question on the methodology. We do incorporate analysis of anything that is somewhat macro, but we view it from a technical perspective. So when we're looking at the dollar index, we're looking at it from a trending perspective. Same thing with treasury yields and gold prices and crude oil prices, all of which, of course, influence equities. And from a trending perspective, and to this end, we're using these sort of trend following or momentum indicators like the MACD, we are seeing very strong uptrends in treasury yields and also the dollar. And I think we have to trust that those uptrends will keep hold until they prove us otherwise. Um, in the near term, it's looking like consolidation or further consolidation is likely, and, and it's not a very difficult call to make after the strong run-up set we've seen, but we did have some signs of short-term exhaustion there behind the dollar index and also treasury yields that are supporting some consolidation within the context of their uptrends. And of course, with that, we have the potential for oversold bounces and treasury bond prices and really some stabilization there in relative strength terms versus the equity market or the S&P 500. 
in this kind of environment, we're always looking at relative strength as well. We're looking for spots of strength and weakness versus the broader market. And with that, we, we tend to just use price to price ratios. So we'll look at something like gold or, or an ETF representing gold, divide that by the S&P 500 and look to see if it's outperforming, acting as a safe haven, which it has done um, most of this year. So we like to try to find those relative strengths sort of spots and, and to emphasize those in our positioning or recommendations. I happen to like relative strength a lot myself. And I'm wondering, um, do you, are you using it to help you find entry points for if you're trying to um, go along with one of these bounces when you do, or are you looking for the eventual bottom when you do find or think you've seen that bottom? Are you going to be looking at relative strength in the sectors or in different styles to help you gauge what exactly you want to buy when it looks like the overall market is finally uh, turning up? Yeah, for sure. We're, we're always going to watch relative strength for this from macro technical inputs, gold versus the S&P 500 for one, and also on the sector front. In fact, it's a big piece of our ETF, which is called the Fairlead Tactical Sector ETF, or TACK as the ticker. That uh, ETF is looking at the relative strength and momentum behind the various sectors, and it's poised to remove itself from those sectors in an environment like this. In fact, right now, it only has exposure to energy, at which time it will move more risk off with positions in short-term treasuries, long-term treasuries, and gold proxies. So uh, that's something that's very important to our process. And we do tend in bear market cycles to see underperformance, especially from the technology sector. And that's certainly been the case this year. And yet, when we come out of those bear market cycles, we expect technology and often consumer discretionary and, and perhaps to a lesser degree communication services to be the sources of relative strength in the earlier stages of that sort of newly established bull market. So if we were to see meaningful improvement in relative strength behind technology, we would see that as a positive development. And that's something that our ETF would pick up on, sort of ready to add exposure back to the sectors as they gain their or regain their momentum. And various ones will pick up some relative performance. Let me ask you, let me, let's stick on the TAC, T-A-C-K ticker, uh, ETF, Fairly Tactical Sector, sector Fund. Um, are these, when you're talking about your top-down approach, how, how mechanical is this? Is it discretionary? How did this come about and how does this uh, represent your thinking when you have this product to offer your clients? Well, it is discretionary, but it's systematic and 100% systematic, barring some crazy events. So we hope not to have to change. Our we have those if every once in a while here in the modern <laughs> markets. We do. It's true. Uh, so we reserve the right to change the model if we are forced to do that by the market. But the model is based on our methodology, and it's designed to leverage exactly what we discussed, which is those sort of sector trends, momentum and relative strength behind them, and then has the ability to move more risk off with alternative asset classes, including the short term treasuries, long term treasuries and gold uh, using ETFs to represent those spaces. We found that a lot of investment advisors, especially were trying to do something like this themselves sort of a sector rotation strategy and, and agreeing with us that the best way to outperform the S&P 500 is really to be in the right sectors. I mean, the spread between sector performance every year is just massive. And, and energy is a great example of that over the past two yes. years or so. I mean, just the outperformance there. So if you had underweight exposure to energy, naturally that puts you at a disadvantage uh, versus some kind of just straight uh, sort of market cap exposure to the S&P 500. So we try to emphasize that relative strength. And, and that way where we create sort of a... a I guess, a systematic way for investors to basically be exposed to the market when the market dictates it, uh, but to be more risk off to protect from very steep drawdowns of which we've certainly seen this year. Let's talk about the precious metals because gold and silver finally perked up um, very recently. Now they have before uh, this year, but we've seen uh, all kinds of bounces met with heavy bouts of selling. Um, 
you know, and, and a, a lot of this is hand in hand with the declining dollar, which we've also seen recently. But do you think these legs, are you seeing anything in the technical indicators that give you uh, at least some sites that maybe gold, these moves in gold and silver have legs finally, because they've frustrated a lot of investors to the downside when everybody, all everybody's here is, is inflation, inflation, inflation. It's overly simplistic to say buy gold at that point. But do the technicals, do the technicals finally confirm maybe what people have been thinking? Yeah, I mean, listen, there are intermediate term downtrends in place across sort of the precious metals complex, and it's been as frustrating for us as the next person. Uh, but gold uh, as a commodity has come into very long term support. For us, it's at about $15.93 per ounce, and it's based on something called the monthly cloud model. It's a model that tends to lend itself very well to commodities and FX in particular. And so there is some long term support. We don't feel like there, there's a major break down there as at this time for gold and now it seems to be reacting alongside silver platinum to this intermediate term oversold condition finally and at, at a very minimum these 50-day moving averages look surmountable uh, but it's still too early to suggest that they're reversing their intermediate term downtrends to that end we'd need to see intermediate term momentum shift to a greater degree than we have to this point. So we'll be watching our indicators. There's some certainly positive short-term action there, but it's too early to call these uh, bullish reversals that are lasting in nature. And you mentioned the cloud there, um, not cloud computing. I believe you're referring to Ichimoku clouds, and I've seen these pervade your analysis. And really interesting, I I found I stumbled upon these a long, long time ago. And I think the market history is there was a Japanese investor in the 1940s, maybe even a little bit before, who uh, back tested by hand these very complicated sets of rules and drawings uh, with respect to uh, the Ichimoku Ichimoku clouds. And uh, after back testing these on the Japanese market over years and years, uh, people are still using them today. Um, a picture is worth a thousand words. So we're going to put one up here in a second. You won't be able to see it. Uh, but just describe generally how you use the cloud and you could use gold as an example. Yeah, it's a great long term trend following gauge. So we put it into that sort of trend following category. It's also useful as a gauge of support or potential area of buying pressure and resistance or potential area of selling pressure. And we look at it across time frames. So right now, gold would be below the cloud on the daily chart. So short term, um, it still you know has that resistance. On the weekly chart, it's also below. So that means that intermediate term to longer term trend is lower. And yet on the monthly chart, as mentioned, that cloud-based support is still intact. So we're looking at where price is relative to the cloud itself. We're looking at the cloud as potential resistance, or in this case for gold on the monthly chart, as support. And like you said, you said a picture, you know, speaks a thousand words. I think the Ichimoku in, in Japanese, and forgive me if I screw this up, but I, I think it means something like one look. And it's one complete look of the overall trend and support and resistance. And it's been in use for uh, what I understand is even centuries. So, so it's really very valuable to us. And for anything that has sort of deep global liquidity to it, um, that's where it especially can add some value. I have to tell you, I was uh, Googling uh, Ichimoku Cloud, and yes, one look is literally what it means there. Um, and just amazing that somebody was able that or multiple people were able to do this by hand. And also, I would mention when uh, these markets were trading seven days per week over there, still applicable. Um, let me switch gears. Uh, you got your start, and I'm reading over some notes you sent by email at Dorsey Wright. And this is, I believe they're still part of the NASDAQ and you were charting point and figure charts. Now, these, this is also something that a lot, if somebody hasn't seen a point and figure chart, they might not even know what it is, but it represents market information. And it's just a different way of looking at things. And it really captures trends in a way that traditional charts that we're used to looking at uh, don't. Maybe you could get into that a little bit. I love point and figure charts, and if anybody hasn't seen them, they're they're characterized by X's and O's, and X's is when the price is going up, and O's is when it's going down. So it looks like a big sort of tic tac toe sheet. <laughs> yeah, uh, yes. they're they're really valuable in that they help eliminate some noise. So in, in a way, what I'm doing now, while I'm not using point and figures anymore, I am using moving averages quite a bit, and, and some short term ones especially. And their design is to minimize some of the noise and help you sort of smooth out 
about the prevailing trend and also have a sense as to whether it's reversing. And I think that's where we can get real value from those point and figure charts, to which I certainly credit Tom Dorsey to mention his name again, you know, mm -hmm. for teaching me that discipline and also just teaching me the value of hand charting, really being close to the market to understand the day to day price moves and their influences uh, in terms of the indicators that we're now using today. So really valuable to study them. They're not quite as digestible necessarily to everyone in, in that they're just such a different format. So we now sort of uh, gravitate towards the bar charts, which are, are a little bit more digestible. Uh, but, you know, both still have value and really great for identifying breakdowns and breakouts. Yes, definitely unorthodox. One thing that strikes me here, and I've noticed a, a few other people that I've interviewed in this Yahoo Finance Uncut series is, you were you were doing this by hand uh, back in the day, and some people still do it by hand. Helene Meisler uh, is one of the names on Twitter that uh, still does that. How how important do you think it is it to really get your hands dirty and understand the nitty gritty behind some of these indicators, uh, behind some of the chart to be able to st understand what these charts are representing? I think it's easy to look at a chart and say, well, the direction is up, but there's a lot of nuance in there and you have different types. Personally, I like candlesticks because of the depth of information. You can see uh, rejections and support levels more clearly. Uh, just talk to me in general about uh, your background and I guess in how you're seeing the market and how you develop this with a hands-on approach. Yeah, that hand charting experience was invaluable. I mean, it, it just is the best way to stay close to market action. Of course, now we have so much more capacity with all the software available to us. And, and so we do a lot less of that. But if I were an investor or trader and had sort of a concentrated portfolio, not a long list of names, but a short list of names that I was active in, by all means, I think it's a great exercise, whether it's point and point in figures or otherwise. I think it's just the best way to stay close to things. And I, I also like the candlestick charts because I think they show a bit more of a complete picture in terms of that the body versus the tails of the highs and lows for each bar. We use the bar charts in part because we're publishing technical strategies research and we need the space <laughs> so oh, yes you know that the candlesticks are a bit wider and so we have some some space constraints in our research that sort of got us away from that we just couldn't fit them on the page but um they are also very valuable i i wouldn't down honestly any technical indicators so it's not there's not any holy grail of course out there in terms of technical indicators it's more about how you're using them how you're applying them i mean if you do it systematically and you're coming back to the same tools the same discipline i think that's where you can get the most value out of it I, I like what you said just there. I want to expand on that. There's no holy grail because you look on Twitter and I'm getting ads all the times for a bunch of holy grails that I know are junk and they're not going to offer me any advantages. But um, talk to me or just maybe talk to the viewers here. What kind of filter should people be wearing or seeing when they're looking at somebody who's uh, selling them, whether it's a strategy for trading, whether it's a, it's a solicitation for their money and they're going to trade it? Uh, because there is a lot of snake oil salespeople out there. There are, unfortunately, and uh, there are some great indicators. There are some great firms. I'd put you among them, uh, but there is a lot of noise as well. So how do you sift through that? Yeah, I mean, that's hard. I would always approach any of that kind of unsolicited advice at with skepticism. Uh, that's always healthy anyway. And what I always recommend to the people that I talk to is that, you know, if you can just kind of hone in on a couple of, of people that you respect in terms of their advice, or even a couple of sort of um, tools or, or methodologies that resonate with the way you think about the markets or, or the world, I think if you can just hone in on maybe two of those, that, that will be the best way to reduce all the noise that's out there. What's hard is if you're trying to make a decision and you've got, you know, five, six different sort of things in your ear in terms of that uh, different biases. You're you're going to get your confirmation bias there where you're just going to listen to the one that, that makes the most sense to you. Uh, but if you just can kind of narrow in on things that, that suit your way of thinking and also always be skeptical on those unsolicited inquiries and what have you, I think that's the, the best way to approach it. And also to have multiple disciplines um, sort of behind your investing. We, we believe technical analysis 
analysis is really the best complementary discipline to both fundamental and macro research. We think that it, you know technicals will help you understand what the prevailing trends are, what what is risk reward, uh, but it, technicals will not tell you anything about the companies if you're investing in stocks. It won't tell you anything about the Fed if you're um, you know investing off of macro inputs. So I think to have kind of that holistic view of the markets is really important as well. And to reward each discipline for what they're best at. Sounds like a lot of work. Um, <laughs> and, it, and it is. Uh, if you're going to be trading your own money, I think it's important for people to realize that you're going up against uh, some people who put in dozens and dozens and dozens of hours and billions of dollars. Um, there's a lot of money in this. There's a lot of time in this. And on a short term basis, um, I think people are kind of competing against each other as traders, it's kind of a zero sum game in the short term. If you're a passive investor over the long term, well, yeah, a rising, a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, I, I think um, I like to talk about risk management in these uh, webinars here. And I think this would be a good point to do that in. How how do you view risk management? I because the average person, the average trader, especially newer traders, don't really come in with a set plan, and they're just kind of back filling the details later. Uh, short term trades turn into long term trades when they go against them. What's your approach to risk management? Well, in a bear market cycle, obviously we want to be hedged or just underexposed entirely to the equity market. So that's where we start. We start with a top-down input as a as an understanding of how exposed we want to be. So right there, you're getting sort of the inherent risk management by just having a long-term trend or bias on your side to make sure those long-term indicators are supporting or otherwise your positioning. So that that gives you an advantage right there. And it certainly wouldn't I, I believe it was 2008 that really um, a lot of technicians got a good name and sort of became more prominent because they were beating the market. They were doing better because they avoided the big drawdowns or at least, you know, sort of sold closer to the peak. And they did that by tracking long term trend following gauges. And, and so just having those on your side is going to increase your probabilities for succeeding in the market. So to have that bias is important. And then if you are taking any counter trend positions to keep a shorter term bias um, on those counter trend positions is important because they are counter trend and they're likely to ultimately give way to the the prevailing trend resuming. And then also, of course, some kind of stop loss discipline. And the stop loss discipline, it's, it's not going to be the same for everyone, but it's important to us. We like to see a support level that's well defined, that's not too far from our entry point. And to make sure that a breakdown below that support level would be a trigger to stop us out of that position. So to always have defined risk and for us based on support, for others, it might be based on a percentage stop loss. Uh, there, there's ways to do it that's automated. There's ways to do it that's a little bit more subjective like, like we do, but um, it, there just has to be some way to manage downside risk through a stop loss discipline. So all of the above is very important, but really just key to have those long term trends on your side. And what we notice is that in a bear market cycle, the bear markets capture some of the biggest updates over history. Yes. So you have these and, and I guess to the point of what's happening with the markets right now with this oversold bounce. Uh, you know, these big updates can be really fast and furious. And, and unfortunately, when they are, that's more characteristic of a relief rally as opposed to at the beginnings of a long term turnaround. And, and that's the case vice versa in an uptrend or bull market. You'll see really fast and furious pullbacks and they feel pretty awful, but they end pretty quickly. We, we felt that a lot you know, preceding this bear market cycle, that pullbacks were very quickly met with buyers. Well, uh, on this side of things, unfortunately, a lot of these relief rallies are very quickly met with sellers. I think the best comparison that we have to the very current short term environment is late May. When we saw a bounce unfold, and really the bounce was maybe four or five days in duration, and uh, you know it's really it, let's call it a fleeting bounce, and that kind of thing can really be frustrating for investors. So to have a way to navigate those bounces and and to leverage them to use them as selling opportunities, um, the best way to us to do that is by just tracking the short term indicators, and again making sure they're also on your side. 
Great, great discussion here. You mentioned uh, prevailing trend, stop losses. In terms of risk management, how about position sizing? When you're getting into a trade, what are you thinking? Does it? Uh, do you want it to be a certain size in your portfolio to max out at a certain size? If you have some huge gains on it, will you actually trim the position as those gains are made so that it uh, takes up a, a smaller part of your portfolio? Different people, different strategies. Yeah, I mean, that's hugely important. I'd call it portfolio construction. I, I would say that technical analysis isn't necessarily where that comes from, but it can certainly be one input into your position sizing because you can derive levels of conviction uh, from the indicators and from the setup, certainly. And that level of conviction can then be translated into a position size. But of course, that's a, sort of a bigger story in terms of having the risk metrics in place and the controls in place more from a portfolio construction standpoint. In developing the model behind the TAC ETF, of course, that was a consideration. We took some outside counsel on that point, uh, just knowing that it wasn't really our, directly our discipline. And we came to the, the sense that the equal weight positions in the various sectors, so we have the economic sectors of which we're uh, allowing for eight positions, so we will equal weight those positions at about 12 and a half percent when the market is firing on all cylinders. We'd have eight sector positions, all equal weighted. Um, but that's a decision that stems from our strategy, trying to emphasize the smaller sectors that are outperforming, like in this case, energy, uh, while you know, sort of having more equal weight exposure or inline exposure to, to most others outside of technology, which of course has such a big footprint in the market these days. We talked about your ETF uh, briefly before, and I wanted to expand the the direction of the conversation, the scope of it to include your founding of Fairlead, your current firm in 2018. You got your own shop. I, I believe it's female only. Speak to that if you would like. Um, what brought this about and how how are you enjoying having your own shop in the midst of this market environment? What emer emerged to be uh, you know, throughout the entire pandemic as well? Yeah, so Fairlead Strategies, it is nationally recognized as a small woman, woman owned business, and that obviously differentiates us. It's still a male dominated field that we're in here. Um, and yet really what, what our primary focus is on adding value to our clients through our research and through our consulting services, and then of course offering the ETF as an investable product, a way to kind of express our views um, by actually you know, uh, picking up some shares of the ETF. So, so our business has grown nicely, I, I'd say with uh, the downside volatility um, comes higher demand uh, because people are asking more questions. And this is where there is a bit of a gap at times between the fundamental uh, sort of prowess of a company and the way that's translating into the stock's price action. So it, it does raise some questions. It tends to draw folks to technical analysis. And we've definitely noticed that in our conversations and in our subscription growth. Um, but but Fairly, it has been a great move for me. I, I spent most of my career on the sell side uh, working for broker dealers on Wall Street. And that was really um, invaluable experience that helped me understand how to serve clients and uh, really gave me a broader understanding of the markets and how to approach them, uh, you know, from my perspective, but also the how it fits in sort of the big scheme of things in terms of technical analysis alongside these other disciplines, which are also so important. Yes, and we were talking just before the show uh, about some of your experience with your own firm. I asked you if you were getting a bunch of calls because of all the volatility in the market, and you said, well, not necessarily. Our clients know where the market is and what's going on. I don't want to put words into your mouth, but it sounds like you have some fairly sophisticated clients here where compared to some of the people I talk to who are just fielding calls left and right, is it time to get out of the market? Should I be buying more um, panic clients? Not what you're experiencing here? You know, I think it's all about staying communicative. And, and if the clients feel that they know what your views are, then they're less likely to have to come to you with questions. We we have found that a lot of our clients, many of whom are investment advisors themselves, they are getting a lot of questions because they're actually holding client assets. And of course, their clients are probably, you know, in, in sort of worry mode right now. And many of them are seeing their portfolio shrink and that's upsetting to them. So naturally, they'll 
will lob a phone call into their advisors, but we don't hold client assets in that way. So we're not fielding those types of calls, but we definitely sense that, well, one, our, I do think our clients are quite sophisticated, but um, it really runs the gamut. Some are very new to technical analysis as well. And I just think it's a matter of always having a very clear technical uh, sort of takeaway from the methodology that we use and making sure that people understand not only how you feel about things, but where that is coming from so that they can make their own decisions with the full um, amount of information available to them from our indicators. So we try to make sure that people uh, know where we're going and um, and yet we have no crystal ball. So we, we are just kind of in the markets with them and trying to put more probabilities in our favor. You know, you just said no crystal ball, and that is the truth. Nobody has a crystal ball, but we can outline what we believe to be certain scenarios and assign probabilities to them. And just getting back to the discussion about separating some of the good from the bad out there in terms of who's offering what in trading strategies and advice and what have you. Uh, I've, I've noted over the years that the people who I trust the most tend to think in probabilities and they express themselves that this way. Whereas people who express themselves in absolute, like the gold bottom is in, you have to buy something now. Crypto is taking off for the next 12 months. Um, a lot of these calls, while they, they stir the soul or whatever have you, they might get you, entice you to press the buy button there, not necessarily the sagest advice. And then meanwhile, you have people who are kind of telling it like it is, who don't necessarily grab the headline, the headlines because, well, they don't necessarily have that certainty, but that's really what it's about. So I'm wondering what your, what your view is as somebody who's inside the industry and has to deal with that. Yeah, I mean, we, we're very mathematical and sort of level headed in how we approach the markets because these are technical indicators. There's no story behind them. They at times are even binary. They'll be on a buy signal or a sell signal or positive or negative. So we feel like in a way we're just reporters ourselves, just imparting uh, the takeaway from this combination of indicators that we're using. And there's not really a, a great way to sensationalize that. And, and that might be what would grab a headline more so. Uh, but importantly, this is real money we're, we're uh, you know talking about, we're investing in. So we wanna take it really seriously. And also that systematic approach, I think is where we find the value in it. Um, and again, that goes for ourselves as, as the portfolio manager, but also in terms of the advice that we're presenting. I do think it's important important for folks to just, you know, put the trends on their side. So starting long term and then drilling into the various time frames. So we're concerning ourselves over the multiple time frames just to help all different types of clients know how best to navigate the volatility. We have some that might be interested in counter trend exposure to leverage some of these, these uh, strong relief rallies, and they tend to be more nimble and more aggressive trading leveraged ETFs. And then we have some that are just long term, more passive buy and hold type investors that are just out there trying to minimize some of the drawdowns or trying to find some opportunities after this bear market cycle. I, I, I like uh, what you said there that you kind of you kind of relate to your work and as a reporter. You're just reporting the story that is told by the technicals um, and not necessarily the opportunity to sensationalize. Although I would say, you know, I, I've seen a lot of headlines regarding the death cross, the golden cross, and that's kind of a sensationalized way of maybe describing certain moving average crossovers. But for the most part, yeah, technical analysis can be um, very, and should be, should be uh, arm's length here. Um, I was going to go in a different direction here. Oh, we were talking about, um, I think we touched on analogs before. You have a market analog. I'm looking at a chart of the VIX. This goes back many years. And you're looking at potential similarities between the situation we found ourselves in 2007, 2008 with the VIX and today. And we really haven't hit uh, a longer term spike. So I'm wondering what you're seeing in this chart itself and also what this means, um, just in general, what you look for in market analogs, if you would extend this, for instance, to the S&P 500 or something else. Analogs can be pretty dangerous, right? Yes. <laughs> but, but history can rhyme. We know that or else we wouldn't be doing technical analysis. And um, there are times at which some of these setups will just remind you of something. And, and that's what happened for us with the VIX or the CBOE volatility index, which we use as a transactional gauge of market sentiment. And some folks were getting comfortable with them, um, I guess, the 
position of the VIX not having spiked. And we just looked back over history and, and we found that if indeed it's a bear market cycle that we're talking about, and I don't think anybody would argue against that at this point for, for the current cycle. Hope not. The, these cycles really have always culminated with a VIX reading close to 50, if not 80 to 90, like we saw at the end of the 2008 bear market and during the COVID sort of, I call it a corrective low, but I guess technically it was a bear market, a very swift one. So, so those high readings in the VIX show fear in the marketplace, and we would argue that the fear has not been terribly high as of yet. We see see a VIX resistance level around 35, and that was very reminiscent of that period in 2008 or ahead of the late 2008 decline. So we're we're nervous, you know, about the setup in the VIX where we are actually looking for short-term uh, contraction in volatility, which would mean that the market can bounce here. After which the market would be potentially set up for a pretty big volatility spike. Uh, we hope it's more like 50, not like 80 to 90. And we think it's probably more likely the, the 50 area. Uh, but even that first 50 reading during a bear market cycle, it doesn't really tend to be the end of it. It tends to be the beginning of that bottoming process. We often see another VIX reading in that kind of range uh, within the next year or so. So I wouldn't take a lot of uh, sort of peace of mind with the VIX 50 reading to say, this is it, it's all over, uh, but rather let the momentum gauges guide us in, in terms of a longer term turnaround. Anything else you're you're looking at in terms of market internals stuff below the hood? Uh, you could maybe the VIX futures term structure. Uh, I, anything we can get as wonky as you want. Just wondering uh, what you're actually looking at uh, besides some of these top level uh, indicators and markets that we've been talking about. Well, we look at a collection of market internal measures and, and they're really kind of tertiary in our methodology. We're first starting with support and resistance. We're using the indicators and then we're consulting the market internals, which would include the VIX. And those market internals will give you takeaways in terms of what is breath and sentiment, how is leadership, is volume showing some kind of emotional trading. All of that can be a great color to have. And, and we really do perk up and get, get interested in it when we see a lot of them at X extremes and extremes that are just, you know, compared to historical overbought and oversold levels for those indicators. So we look at them collectively because what we found is that if you highlight just one market internal measure and that becomes your uh, primary tool. Like I think a lot of people were talking about breath thrusts in that sort of summertime relief rally. Yes. Well, it, it, that certainly had no lasting implications for the market. So there was risk in just adhering to that one sort of market internal. Whereas if you can take them together and get it more of a diversified look at those market internals, I think there's more power to that and a little bit more safety to that as well. Uh, it's when we see a collection of these readings that we really pay attention. And any any uh, markets like uh, I know some people are looking at the high yield market right now. They're looking at transports. Anything you want to see perk up and lead the market out of uh, the eventual bottom when you think you might have seen it base. I think it's important to keep an eye on the dynamic between sort of the mega caps and the mm. major indices and then also the higher growth benchmarks. Uh, the higher growth benchmarks like an ARK K ETF is one example. They've been trending lower in some cases since early 2021. And because of that, they're more oversold on a long-term basis. And some have even seen upticks in our longer term momentum gauges, meaning that as they've come down or seen like little you know, upticks in the histograms and what have you. And that could be the precursor to a bottom in those areas. By no means are we recommending adding counter trend exposure there because we think the bottoming process will be drawn out. We think we'll see even new lows cut out by a lot of these benchmarks. We've already have seen it from a bottom up perspective. But importantly, we think that they're trying to find their footing, whereas the downside leadership on the next downdraft is more likely to come from the mega caps based on their relative strength posture and just based on their posture more broadly in terms of these long term indicators, which rather than showing any incremental improvement, uh, they've, they've just been deteriorating and deteriorating uh, for months and diverging to the downside. So that would be the likes of Apple and Tesla hmm. names that that folks have found safety in in the past. 
I was going to ask you specifically about Apple and Tesla, since each one of those seems to be almost their own sector or asset class. The way people view them, very important to the market. Um, any any others out there? Alphabet also big, Amazon also big, uh, but not necessarily the cachet. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of some of these other mega caps? Yeah, I mean, they're all somewhat similar in that they're in downtrends year to date, and, but those downtrends have various levels of maturity. The, the meta downtrend, for one, it looks a bit more like a high growth stock than the rest of them. Um, Amazon's somewhat interesting to us because it does have a longer term support level nearby. And uh, we'd like to see some you know, basing before we believe that that support is uh, going to act as a cushion for the stock, but but we're keeping an eye on some important levels for Amazon. And then Microsoft and, and Alphabet, they're really very highly correlated to one another and they have fairly recent breakdowns below their summertime lows, which of course just tells us that the downtrends are still intact there. And with, with that, we'd be a better seller of an oversold bounce um, just in general until these downtrends start to really culminate in that kind of basing phase. And there's also Berkshire Hathaway. I uh, wonder what you're thinking of the value trade, financials and energy really picking up. Well, as we talked about before, energy just outperforming uh, hands and above uh, anything else this year. What do you think of some of the value trade? And is that something you might be looking to get into more? I know you're going to look at the technicals as they present themselves in the moment, but is that something that you're really keeping an eye on now? Maybe with your macro view, expecting some of that to continue. Well, we will look at the sort of ratios between growth and value, and, and value does look like it should outperform growth uh, until this bear market cycle really culminates. And there's going to be periods at which that breaks up, but overall, we would expect that outperformance from value. But the catch is that it's a bear market cycle, so outperformance doesn't necessarily mean absolute gains. And so we're pretty skeptical in terms of the momentum behind a lot of the value stocks out there, Berkshire included. Uh, the momentum is really not very good from a long-term perspective still, and that would apply to most financial stocks as well. There's always pockets of strength, but we just have to acknowledge that we're fighting the prevailing trend in the broader market. And with that influence, uh, the odds will be against us in terms of really taking advantage of this relative performance. I mean, even the utility sector, which was a previous holding in the TAC ETF, uh, that got kicked out because it has, even though it's outperformed and by, by a pretty strong degree, it has just seen a pretty significant loss of long-term upside momentum. And so we wanna just be uh, very careful to not just get caught in sort of a relative world, but also try to reward things that are showing positive momentum in absolute terms. You really stick to your guns in all your answers. Very, very impressive. I uh, want to change it up. We got a couple minutes left. I was looking in the background and it looks like I was seeing some pictures of a fishing trip or I'm not sure exactly what that was, but just if you can tell us what's on your wall, what's hanging on your wall and how that might relate to your personal life, <laughs> if you don't mind. Oh, that's funny. Well, I, I do love fishing. I have to say I'm, I'm a fly fisher woman or at least a uh -huh. wannabe one. Um, you know, it's something that brings you out into nature, which I love and being out outdoors. And it's also something that can get your mind off of the markets and, and other things. You really get kind of absorbed in the moment with that. And there's some joy, of course, of, of bringing it a fish in. Um, but also we've done some sort of excursions, if you will, with some other uh, sort of financial uh, strategists, macro experts and things like that over, over the time. And we've done a lot of sort of getaways with other macro strategists. And it's a great way to kind of bond in a different setting where we're not sitting in front of a Zoom camera like this or at a, across a conference table uh, when you're where, when you're fishing uh, with friends, it's really kind of uh, a more casual conversation. Yeah, lots of metaphors to explore there. Maybe in a future a future webinar. Really appreciate your time here. Katie Stockton, founder and managing partner of Fairlead Strategies, also the port, uh, portfolio manager of the TAC ETF. Always great to talk with you. Learned a lot and looking forward to talking with you again here. And to everybody watching, thank you for joining us on another episode of Yahoo Finance Uncut.